Hi, good morning and welcome to this sixth in a series of webinars delivered by Visit Scotland in conjunction with Business Gateway's Digital Boost programme. My name is Andrew Craig from Visit Scotland and today's session is part of a, a recovery programme, a recovery package of webinars aimed at um, giving digital support to tourism businesses. And once again this week we're joined by Gary Ennis from NS Design in Glasgow, a company that offers uh, social media and digital skills training. If you remember if you were here last week, last Wednesday, Gary led part one on search engine optimization uh, for tourism businesses and he's leading again today as we delve a wee bit further into the world of, of SEO. A few intimation reminders as we before we kick things off. You're all in um, microphone webcam off mode um, and we'll be, as per usual, we'll be distributing a, a link to the PDF version of the presentation, Gary's presentation, later on uh, and during the session, uh, as well as asking for your feedback via a, a link that you'll see later on uh, and we'll put out via the, the chat functionality of GoToWebinar. Uh, later on in the session as well. If you have any queries about any aspects of search engine optimization, then as usual you can ask them via the questions tab in your GoToWebinar control panel. Um, and as this is the same as last week, this is an, a, a 90 minute session today and we'll spend 10 to 15 minutes at the end, sort of around uh, quarter to one. Uh, Gary will finish up and we'll spend 10 to 15 minutes discussing any questions on search engine optimization that you have. And again, we're offering the opportunity for participants to take part in a free uh, Visit Scotland digital review with one of our industry relationship managers. Uh, these reviews will assess um, many elements of your digital output. Um, including, I suppose, not limited to social media, online bookings, uh, your social media, pres uh, sorry, your presence on search engines, and uh, your website performance itself. Uh, and a sign-up opportunity for that will come as soon as you leave today's session. You'll have a little notification will pop up on your screen and ask if you want to participate in one of these uh, digital reviews. If you've already signed up previously, you don't need to sign up again. What we would say is if you're signing up, you do need to remember that it will be the onus will be on you to um, take action as a result of the review itself. And you do need to be a tourism business. Uh, it's open to all tourism businesses in Scotland. And then finally, just before I let I hand things over to Gary, a quick screenshot of the Digital Boost homepage programme delivers a lot of free services including up to 21 hours of one-to-one -one specialist digital support um, as well as workshops and webinars um, being advertised there on vgateway.com slash digital boost. You can book places on um, the, the website there on, on a lot of upcoming uh, web uh, webinars and uh, you can also uh, look at a bunch of online guides on I think it's 21 digital topics and video tutorials and a further uh, nine digital topics. So that's enough for me as per usual I speak too long. Uh, we'll hand things over to Gary who's here representing NS Design and he's going to lead uh, today's session. Gary over to you and I'll just uh, make sure that you can Brilliant. share Thank you, Andrew. Um, wait, I'll just quickly take control of the screen when I can. There we go. Let me just, there, that, that should be us now. Are you seeing the agenda, Andrew? If you can just confirm that and I'll crack on. Oh, good. Well, good. Well, thank you very much. Uh, right, well, again, as Andrew has just said, thank you to everyone who uh, attended uh, last week. I know there's a few uh, names that are here again today, so hopefully I didn't put you off too much. Um, thank you also for some great feedback on last week as well, which we've had a little look at. Uh, if you're here today for the first time, didn't attend last session's SEO part one, but you're here for SEO part two, don't panic, you'll learn a lot of good things today and what I would suggest, uh, and I'll, I'll remind you of all of this at the very end as well, um, that I, I would suggest that you go and re-watch the, uh, the video that we recorded last week. Um, 
uh, and kind of catch up so that you're kind of covering all of the SEO aspects, not just what we're going to look at today. So today's agenda, <clears throat> very, very quickly, um, an awareness of some of the technical factors regarding SEO. Last time, last week, we looked at the kind of what we call the on-page SEO, the keywords, the content. Uh, today, we're moving away from that to talk about the technical side. Um, it will be a wee bit geeky at times, but I promise to make it uh, understandable depending on the level uh, that you're at on all of this. Uh, so some of the technical issues, we'll look at some of the off-page SEO. Again, I'll explain all of what that means later on. In essence, it means the things that the other people do a Away from your site, your web pages, etc. Uh, we'll look at the importance of local SEO, the fact that uh, many locals are looking for your business and how do we attract them for the right reasons. Uh, and that will then lead us into uh, the latter part of today's session, which is all around Google My Business um, and making sure that you have a Google My Business profile, you're actually using it and have optimized it to best suit you. Again, all with the goal of driving awareness, visibility, traffic about you, your business, your website. Uh, again, uh, all part of the SEO remit. Uh, this slide I, I'll be very quick on. I showed this last week. Again, just to confirm, last week we looked at the off-page element, um, sorry, the on-page element, my apologies, of, of SEO, the content, the how you write things, the words you use, your choice of keywords. Again, if you didn't attend last uh, week's session, I do strongly recommend that you revisit that because it is the kind of the, the heart of SEO, um, you know, what you should do before you tackle maybe some of the things we're going to look at today. Um, today, as I say, we're moving on to some of the more technical and off-page stuff, so backlinks, technical setup, local, uh, making sure things work on a mobile and how that influences Google and so on. So just a wee reminder based on uh, the slide I showed last week. Um, again, I'll spend no time over this. I showed this last week as well. What is SEO? What is search engine optimization? Let's not use jargon. Uh, we shouldn't use acronyms without making sure everybody knows what they mean. Uh, well, there's the Google, uh, the Wikipedia definition of SEO at the top. and in other words, underneath my own definition, it's about convincing Google to get our website higher up the rankings when the right people search for the right things so that we get more right traffic, leading to the potential of business. Now, again, I, I kind of stress that and, and expand on it a little bit uh, in the recorded uh, session from last week. So you can go and have a little look at that when you get the chance. A little reminder to all of you before we crack on, if there are any questions, please just ask away in the question section of uh, go to webinar. Uh, Andrew will be keeping an eye on that and he will be interrupting me if there's any pertinent questions coming in. And of course, we will be dealing with questions at the end as well. So if you've got anything you want from today under the banner of SEO, please just ask away. So uh, let's get technical. I think that was a, a song from Olivia Newton John. It was either that or physical, I can't remember. Uh, so let's move on to the technical side of social media. Um, and let's start with a little bit of a are you even there in the first place question? You know, all of this good stuff we looked at last week, other things we will look at shortly, none of that is in any way worthwhile doing unless, of course, you're, you have the chance of Google returning your website in what they call their index. Um, so here's a little thing that you should all try. And again, you can do this while I'm talking to you live if you're, if you're feeling like multitasking. If not, revisit these slides later on and go through this in a wee bit of detail. You want to make sure that you are listed on Google. Now, the one exception here is, is if you're a brand new website, you've only just launched the thing last week, Google's not yet had a chance to find you, to index you. I'll steer you on that side of things in just a second. But the big danger is that you're not on Google for a very particular reason. And until you change such things, you might never be on Google. So if you go to a Google web browser, you, again, I, I, I won't do this live. I'll just use my slides for just now. And you and you type into the search box site, S-I-T-E, colon, and then your domain name. So the example on the right, site, colon, visitscotland.com. And you should see something like that. Uh, you should see the pages of your website coming up in a Google search results box with the URL, with the title, with the snippet or the meta description. We talked about all of this in a wee bit of detail last week. Uh, and, and, and that's an indication that Google has your website in its index, therefore could be delivered to somebody searching using relevant keywords. OK, if you don't see that, if instead you see uh, nothing or nearly all uh, or most of your pages missing 
or you just see something like this, and I should just warn Visit Scotland and the guys from Visit Scotland with us today, I mocked this up, so don't worry. This isn't what it shows when you search for Visit Scotland. Um, if you see uh, maybe just the domain name and just a, a very generic title, usually related to the name of the business, and underneath that, where you usually get a nice little description, it says, no information available, learn why. If you see that, then don't quite panic, but you have a problem. Uh, and it's usually because you're using what's called a robot.txt file. Now, again, this is a wee bit geeky, as I've already said. A little reminder to you, as per last week, there are kind of uh, links on all of these slides for more detail, for more uh, in-depth uh, awareness about all of the topics that I'm going to cover today. But what do, what do I mean by a robot.txt file? Well, these things are usually uh, added to a website on purposely, usually for a good reason, to hide certain pages or indeed your entire website itself. Um, and often they are done uh, depending on you know who's built your website. If you're getting a web development company to build it, sometimes they will add what's called the robot.txt file because they don't want Google looking at your site while it's under development. And that kind of makes sense. You know, the pages are half built. The content is just kind of mocked up. There's no actual, you don't want to index in the wrong content or fake content or uh, content which isn't finalized yet. So the, so the developer will sometimes drop in a robot.txt file. The problem is, and I've seen this so many times, uh, I mean, it's ridiculous, but true, that if they then forget to remove it, you've got a live site. People can access it, people can type it in manually, they can visit all your pages, but Google is being told not to index the site. It's being told to hide the page, not, not have you in their index. So a quick check on this, and we'll quickly move away because I'm, I'm, I'm focusing on the negative here, but I've seen this so many times that I want to just make sure this was introduced right at the start. Uh, a quick check is if you go to your domain name uh, in a browser, and you add on slash robot.txt. And do you know what? I'll quickly do this live. All right, let me just bring over uh, the NS Design website. Um, so here's my own website, NS Design Co UK, and I'll add in slash uh, robots.txt. Uh, and up comes an actual, let me just zoom in on this just a little bit. Um, up comes an actual file. It doesn't say 404, it doesn't say file not found. It actually gives a robot text because I am actually using one to not block Google from my entire website, but to tell Google not to have certain things in the results that I don't think are actually worthy of anybody ever finding in Google results. So I've got a, a couple of files, a couple of pages that are, are kind of pretty pointless. It's mainly just for people who are looking for uh, our, our stuff on email consent. Uh, there's a whole category of stuff that we used to do, which have now uh, blocked the whole category. Um, and, and also that last one, don't, don't ask me why I'm blocking the Gary and Jan page. I really don't know. I need to check myself, to be honest. <laughs> there's nothing dubious, I promise. Um, but one of the things I am blocking is the WordPress admin system. Because why would I want Google to ever return my my backend CMS login page? You know, here's Gary's login. To why why would why would I ever want? So I'm I'm telling Google to disallow it. Okay, disallow, disallow, disallow. But on the whole, I'm saying allow everything else. Okay. So I'm using a robots text file, not in any great detail, and really it's just to kind of tell Google to block a few things. What you will see is something very similar. Or you'll maybe see a 404 file not found. You're not using one at all, and that's fine. Um, because by not having one, you're basically telling Google that you're not blocking anything. Worst case scenario, you see something like this on the right of the screen. User agent star, that just means telling every search engine. So Google, Bing, um, you know, uh, Yahoo. So every search engine, disallow everything. The slash means everything. The slash just basically means your domain name and everything under it. So if you see something like that, and as I say, as daft as it sounds, I've seen that on so many live websites who are then asking me, why does Google not ever show me? You know, I've done all you've told me. I did my keywords, I've done all my technical, I've done, and they've left a robot text file live. And basically Google is doing what it's told, not indexing anything. It's being disallowed access to everything on the site. So I just wanted to start with that. 
hopefully nearly all of you when you go and check you don't have one or indeed you are allowing access rather than disallowing access to everything but it is important and i do see that a lot so what i want to move on and talk about is if that's how you kind of tell google not to index you how do you tell google to index you now there are a few ways to do it. The simplest way, and, and actually the way that you can um, kind of take maybe a more hands-off approach and just let it happen on it by itself, is to make sure that you are using a Google sitemap. Now, by a Google sitemap, I don't mean a link in the footer of your email, uh, sorry, in the footer of your, your website, which is just another page for the, for the users of your website with links to all of the other pages. And again, you'll see many websites with exactly that. I mean a Google sitemap, which again is quite a geeky file written for Google, not for the general public, that you can give to Google and it will be aware of all of the pages that exist on your website and you're telling Google to go and look at them, go and index them, go and look at all the keywords, go and analyze my titles, my headers, all of the things we covered last time with the, the, the keyword density and my body text, it goes and indexes all of that and decides whether or not you have authority on certain keywords, again, just to revisit a little bit of last week. Um, Rather than me just tell you a little bit more about sitemaps, I want to quickly, uh, to, just to give you another voice to listen to, I'm going to quickly play you a little video. Hi, I'm Daniel Weisberg, Search Advocate at Google. And today, I'll talk about how to use the Search Console sitemaps report. By the end of this video, you should be able to understand what a sitemap is, decide whether you need one or not, and learn how to submit a sitemap and track its status using Search Console. A sitemap is a signal about which URLs you would like Google to crawl on your site. It may provide information on URLs that were recently created or modified and give us some extra information about them. Google supports four main ways for you to provide additional information. You can extend a URL with images included in it. You can also extend a URL with videos included in it. You can include information about alternate languages or country versions with hreflang annotations. And finally, for new sites, you can use a special variation of sitemaps to give us information about the most recent updates. Note that this information won't necessarily be highlighted on Search Console, but you can still provide it in your sitemap. But if I don't have a sitemap, will Google find all my pages? I'm glad you asked, John. Usually, if you have a relatively small website and your pages are properly linked, Googlebot can discover your content, so you don't need to worry about a sitemap. However, if your site meets one of the following criteria, a sitemap might help Google decide what and when to crawl your website. If your site is really large, a sitemap will help Google prioritize the URLs to crawl. If your pages are isolated or not well linked to each other, a sitemap might help Google find those pages. If your site is new or it has a lot of quickly changing content, such as a news website, a sitemap will help Google discover your content. Please remember that using a sitemap doesn't guarantee that all your pages will be crawled and indexed. But in most cases, your site will benefit from having a sitemap, and there is no disadvantage for having one. In addition, sitemaps don't replace normal crawling, and not including URLs in a sitemap won't result in those URLs no longer being crawled. Hmm. Interesting. I might need a sitemap, but how can I create one? Another great question, John. Ideally, the system running your website will make sitemap files for you automatically. For example, you can find a WordPress plugin or Drupal extension if you use those content management systems. Check the documentation from your provider, as every platform is slightly different. We recommend finding a way to automatically generate sitemaps, rather than creating them manually. Usually, this will involve running code on your server. So if you're not a developer, you might need help from one. There are limits to the number of URLs and the maximum size of a sitemap file. 
I'm going to pause it there because that's all we need to show for today. If you need more space. Oh, sorry, let me just uh, close uh, him down. Um, so again, it was a little bit geeky and it's always good to see somebody present and be even more cheesier than me, which is a bonus for, from my perspective. Um, here's just a quick summary of what Daniel just said to you. Okay, A sitemap is essentially just a list of your pages. Uh, and not having one shouldn't impact small sites. If you're a very small website with just five pages, a home page, an about us page, a services page, a contact us page, and uh, one other page that I can't think of. If you're just a small site, as long as those are clearly linked, as long as you've got a good navigation structure and every page is clearly linked from the home page, then Google will probably find your website and crawl it. It will send out what it calls its spider to follow the little links and to, to index all of your small volume of pages because they're easily carefully linked together. If you're a large website with, you know, tens, 50, hundreds of pages or more, um, then not every page is easily linked. Not every page is certainly linked to the home page. Uh, some pages might not be linked at all, what we'll often call an orphaned page. So I've got a particular page, but I don't really have any links to it. So how's Google ever going to find it? So under those conditions, a sitemap is is always a good thing to do. And I personally, myself, think that even small to medium websites will benefit from a sitemap because you'll always be telling Google to, to, to look at all of your pages, to index them, to get them onto the Google results page, and to tell Google about these things in just a wee bit more detail. Now, also what Daniel said, he says you don't want to be creating these things manually because they are quite geeky files. You want to have them generated automatically. Um, if you use something like uh, WordPress, my advice would be looking at, and I think we talked about this last week, the Yoast plugin. Uh, Yoast, Y-O-A-S-T, is a plugin for WordPress, which makes WordPress that little bit more SEO friendly. And one of the things Yoast does is create your sitemaps for you. And then what you do once you've got this link to a sitemap is you submit it to Google Search Console. So I want to just quickly show you where you would do that in Google Search Console, just in case this helps. Uh, in previous uh, Visit Scotland uh, Digital Boost webinars, we have talked about Google Search Console in a little bit of detail. Um, so here's me logged into my own Google Search Console. You should have one for yourself, for your own website. Uh, and if I scroll down to the sitemap section of Google Search Console, it basically, because I've already submitted one, they, there is what looks like uh, my, my, my sitemap. If I just go into here and click this and show you, um, so there it's, I've, I've submitted in actual fact what you produces is a number of sitemaps, one for your pages, one for your blog posts, one for your events if you're running an events plugin type of thing. The point is uh, it's, it's generating these pages for you manually and if I just quickly show you what one of these things looks like, um, just to show you, it's fairly geeky. NS Design Pro UK slash. Um, oh, randomly typing in nonsense here. Bear with me. Um, should have pre prepared this in advance. Let me just go and grab uh, the, the the link. Um, uh, it's page sitemap.xml. Let, let me just uh, go and grab that and paste it in. There we go. Um, so it looks like uh, this, and this is why you don't, so there, there's the main pages on our website. We have 12 main pages. We also have, you know, 3,000 blog posts written over the last 20 odd years. So there's the 12 links to the pages. There's the 3,000 links to the blog post. There's the 64 links to the events. Um, and as you can see, it's not just a link to the actual page itself. It shows it's when it's last modified. It tells Google if there's any obvious images on there. Um, and, and, and so suddenly you create these things via Yoast or some other system of your own choosing, and then you upload them into a uh, Google Search Console uh, through what's called the sitemap section. And basically what you're telling Google is here are all of my pages when they were last updated, kind of what's in them, a summary, etc. Go and look at them, go and index them. And so you know that if you create a blog post today, then your your sitemap will be automatic, automatically generated almost immediately because that's what you know that the systems tend to do. And Google Search Console, because it knows where to go and look, it will look every so often. You can see that my Google Search Console last looked at my sitemaps back in July, uh, end of July. So maybe I've done a wee update since then, and it, it will look in the next day or so, I'm certain. And now Google has all of that data in it. It knows about every one of my pages. 
Again, wee bit maybe time to take your head to get around all of this, but it's really important. It's important we understand robot.txt, how to block Google, how to tell Google not to index things and making sure we're not doing it accidentally. And it's more so important to, to understand how to tell Google, here is here are the pages that I want you to index, that I want you to look at, that I want you to return to people. Because if Google has none of that done, if it's not able to find our pages, if you haven't properly linked your, your files, your, your pages together, and it's hitting kind of these blank orphaned pages, it's not able to reach them, then you might have a lot of great content that will never be returned to Google because that's how it does it. It does it via you telling it what to allow and what to block. Um, sitemaps and robot.txt files, important stuff. Bit technical, bit geeky, but hopefully that's been beneficial to you. Let's move on to deal with some easier concepts, uh, things that you can all get to grips with very, very quickly. Uh, and the first thing I want to mention is the need for speed. You can uh, insert your uh, your movie quote uh, of choice in there. Um, you can tell I'm a big Top Gun fan, sad but true. Uh, let's move on to talk about speed. Google ranks uh, websites that are faster, higher. Okay, now it's not quite as black and white as that, but today I'm going to say it is. If my website is identical to your website and we are optimizing for the same keywords and we are basically about the same thing and you came to last week's session two and you know all about your title optimization and your body text and, and all other things being equal, if my website's faster, I'm going to appear higher. Um, and the reason is Google wants to deliver a good, fast, convenient, um, you know, you know, suitable experience that don't have people fed up waiting for your site to appear. So general advice is your site should load under three seconds. Repeat visits even faster, and I'll explain why in just a second. So again, do you know it's a rhetorical question? You can chat to me in the chat box if you like. You can ask any questions of your own if you want in the questions box. Do you know how long your site takes to load? because you should. And there are some easy ways to go and test it. On this slide, there are a few links to some things which you should definitely play with later on. Uh, I'm going to go and play with the, the Google, the, the, the top link just now. I'm going to show you this live, just in case you want to play with it as well. Let me go and paste it into the chat box um, so that if you if you like, you can give that a click. Uh, oh, let me just send that to everyone, rather. Sorry, there we go. Uh, there we go. Um, let me show you what this looks like. This is the Google page speed tool. And uh, if I go and just search for my own domain name, I'll just make my life easier and I won't embarrass anyone too much today by being overly critical. Then this this returns quite, a, a, again, quite a geeky, detailed, there'll be things on the, on, the, on the results page you maybe don't quite understand. I'll talk about some of them. But what it does give you quite nicely is a nice score. Now, straight away, you can see that, oh my goodness, Gary's website is only a 59, 59 out of 100. You know, I'm not going to lie, I'd, I'd like to be 100 out of 100. Um, and notice it breaks it down over mobile speed and desktop speed. If I change to desktop speed, I'm a lot better, I'm a 92. Um, and it, it's basically kind of warning me that maybe my website has a few biggish images, maybe my website from a mobile perspective, people loading it up on a 3G or a 4G phone, Maybe it's acceptable on desktop, the, the, the speed, um, but on mobile, certainly room for improvement. Now, what I like to do at this stage is pause and say, nobody panic, depending on what your speed number is, what your speed score is, because this is all comparative. So if I, I, if I am a, you know, I, 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 I'll just go with the number. If I'm a 59, that only really matters if other people round about me on Google, i.e. my competitor type businesses, those people who could be above me, that only really matters if they are higher than 59. So one of the things I urge you to do when you're doing tests on your own website is do similar tests on your competitor websites. Do similar tests on the businesses which are appearing above and below you on Google. And if every one of your competitors, in my case, is a 40 something, I don't really need to, I guess, of course, I'd love to get higher and higher and higher, but I don't really need to obsess over changing this because I'm faster than they are, because this is about Google putting me ahead of other people doing similar things when somebody is Googling for it. So don't panic, use it as a nice little benchmark uh, and use it to go and kind of compare others um, and just be aware as to where you sit 
comparatively to everyone else. So that's the kind of um, Google, what they call the page speed insights test. Um, what you might also want to do is play with the next link as well. It's called the think with Google test. Um, and it gives you a, a, a kind of, a, a, and I don't mean this badly, it kind of dumbs it down a little bit more. It basically says slow, medium, fast type of thing. Um, but it also gives you the capability to download a free report from Google with loads of great advice as to how to speed things up. So there's loads of places where you can go and test the speed of your website. The third little link on there uh, is a, is a, a free, uh, free uh, tool again. You do need to create an account with it if you want to change server. So you can use GT metrics to do some very clever things. If you know that most of your customers are from the United States or Australia or um, you know Canada or China, or you can actually isolate the tests to people under those conditions. You can choose American servers, you can choose Canadian servers. So again, this is all about having a real understanding of your customer. We talked a lot about this last week, understanding the customer, their behavior, where they are, where they're from, how they do things. So the GT Metrics tool is a nice one to go and uh, do speed tests from different locations to check that you are uh, comparatively faster than some of your competing businesses that you that you want to do better than on Google. So do some speed tests. Uh, again, it, you know, running your, your site through some of these uh, nice little simple test sites, they give you some ideas for improvement. Uh, some of the things that they suggest you do, the kind of top tips at the bottom of the screen, they suggest that you very much start by doing the obvious thing, which is reducing your image size. Often a slow website is caused by big images, big images that you've maybe taken off your mobile phone because that's capable of producing some very, very large file sizes and high, high quality uh, images that you've uploaded. But so you've uploaded this huge pixel size, a huge resolution image, which actually is going to be shown quite small on your website. And especially when that website is viewed on a mobile phone. So you want to make sure your images are optimized. Sometimes you can do this automatically through clever plugins for your website or your, your, your WordPress. Or um, again, depending if you're, a, if you're a Photoshop wizard, then you'll know how to do this yourself. On the assumption that many of you aren't that, there are tools nice and easy free tools to allow you to do some of this yourself. Uh, let me just demonstrate the, the link that's on the slides right now, reduce images. I'm just going to quickly show you this. It's just a free, simple little tool, uh, an online based tool. So here is, here is the website, reduce images. Um, and as it says, it says drag in your image. So I'm just going to go and get a bit of a cheesy image of me. So first thing I'll show you, I'll actually show you this image of me so you can see what it is. There's, there you go, there's me sitting with my very cheesy t-shirt on about to start a Digital Boost webinar. So that's the image which is too big. And, and it is too big um, because you'll see when I drag it in, if I just drag it into here, it says it's one megabyte in size and it's 2,800 pixels length and breadth. It's a big sizable image. I'm probably going to show this on one page of my website, maybe on my blog. It's going to be showing you know, a fraction of that size. And, and that's a megabyte somebody needs to download, which doesn't sound very much if they're on a high speed uh, broadband, but if they're on their mobile phone, if they're on 3G, Google's not going to like it. So that's me uploaded it. Then using this free tool, I can go and reduce the size. I'll make it 70% of the size, um, which will bring the file size down a little bit. I could probably go a lot, lot more than that. Um, I will change the quality of it to 60% because at the moment it's a big high resolution image. Um, and I'll click on the resize button. And for free, very, very quickly, there we go, it's now done it. It's now created the uh, image which is available for me to download. It started at 1.1 megabyte. It's now telling me it's 300 kilobytes. So it's uh, under a third, it's a third of the, um, of the file size. And if I click it, just to prove to you, here is the, the tweaked image very, very quickly for free, much smaller size, much uh, smaller resolution. And as you can see, it looks almost identical to the original. Why? Because it didn't need to be that big and high resolution, et cetera. So go and play with tools like this. Go and learn how to use Photoshop and Canva and any other image manipulation tool and get better at optimizing your website content, especially your images. Okay, that's usually the thing which can slow an awful lot of websites down dramatically. Other things to consider, and again, I'll just introduce these to you today. I won't go into them in too much detail because, again, they're they're, they're fairly fairly complex, fairly geeky. Um, 
it says there you consider using caching and minify your website code again if this this means something to you great because you've already looked into it you're already doing it um again my advice to you if you're using a particular system um cms system content management system like wordpress or whatever is go and investigate caching plugins or minify plugins what these things do is they crunch down the code Okay, they crunch down. So a Minify uh, plugin basically takes all of this nicely formatted code, gets rid of all the empty blank spaces, all the things which aren't actually required, and crunches it down to the bare minimum code. Which I won't lie, when you go and look at the code, if you're ever so inclined, it makes it a nightmare to work with because it's basically all on one big line. There's no line breaks, there's no spacing. There's, but from Google's perspective, you've crunched the file size down to the bare minimum which means a much faster website. Caching is quite similar. Caching is all about making sure that when somebody visits your website, and this is what I said earlier on at the top of the slide, repeat visits should be faster. Caching makes repeat visits faster. Caching basically means when somebody comes for a second time to visit your website, they don't need to download everything again. Your, your website is not telling them, hey, go and grab all these images again that you've already got. Um, it's telling uh, the visitor that they don't need to go and do the database lookup again because they've just done it. And so they're basically kind of pulling static content or indeed not pulling anything because it's there. It's already on their system. So caching is all about just improving the efficiency for repeat visits. And again, you can usually massively improve websites by installing caching uh, functionality, caching. Plot. Again, it's a whole topic in its own right, but be aware of it and maybe do some investigation. Other things you might want to consider, what's called a CDN, a content delivery network. Again, a little bit advanced this one, but if you're at this stage, it's worthy of mentioning because it can make a huge difference to speed. The principle here is you're not hosting your content just in one location, you're hosting your content on multiple locations. How is that possible? Well, you you, you host your images on a UK server, an American server, uh, a New Zealand server, using a content delivery network provider. There are many of them. And what that means is if somebody from New Zealand is looking at your website, they are pulling an awful lot of the content from much closer to them. They don't need to come all the way to the UK to get the data off that server, to pull it back over the internet. They are getting it much more localized to them. Uh, and again, a CDN is certainly something you should consider if you're, a, if you're a big website, if you're trying to really push the boundaries in terms of optimization, it can make a big, big difference. And as I've already said, all of this chat around faster websites, you should always compare against competitor. You know, don't obsess over, oh my goodness, I'm only a 57. I, I want to be 100. 57 only matters if everybody is above 57, you know, for or the competing businesses that you're trying to make sure that you are ranking higher than. So again, I hope this is all making sense, but speed is important. Google wants fast websites uh, and you should certainly do all you can to technically optimize for speed. Uh, my top tip, Start with your images. Always start with your images. Go and go and go and look at every image on your website. Go and go and run your run your website through one of these reports, and it will probably flag up. You have a lot of big images. Um, you probably don't need half of them. Reduce them. Uh, compress them. Optimize them. Makes a big big difference. If you want a real further boost of speed, and again, this is a, just an introduction to this because again, it's far too complex to talk about in the time we have available. You could consider implementing AMP AMP accelerated mobile pages. Now, AMP was developed by Google. It's now used in a variety of guises elsewhere. Facebook have a version of it themselves. Um, basically, what this means is if Google detects somebody is on Google on a mobile phone and they're about to click through to your website on their mobile phone, they could just send them the actual page, which might be quite big and big images and too much code and all of these other things that we've just talked about. Or if it exists, it could give them the AMP page, uh, the AMP, the accelerated mobile page. And, and, and these are things that, again, you can create yourself manually. Don't do that. It's incredibly complex. You will definitely want to look to generate these automatically. Again, depending on the content management system you're using, you can maybe get a plugin for it or there's maybe an option for it. Again, I, I know I keep mentioning WordPress because it's the site, the, 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 um, the system I use myself. Loads of great plugins to do loads of great additional things. One of them is to create AMP pages for all pages of my website which means if somebody from google search comes on a mobile 
when they click the link to my website, it returns almost instantaneously to them. And the reason is Google's already fetched the content in advance. It's being served from Google. They're preloaded. Now, the example to show you is on the screen. Uh, on the left on my mobile, on a mobile phone interface is, is, is the actual page with its slightly better design, which it's with, with its, you know, there's my, my cookie checker at the bottom of it, and there's my full menu. And on the right is the AMP page, and it's been stripped back. It's just mainly text. Uh, there's one image which has been compressed to be really small. The interface has gone. There's no there's no uh, clicks to the rest of the navigation. So I'm, I'm missing out a little bit on people getting the full experience of my content and the rest of my website, but I am massively telling Google uh, that you probably want to favor my content because it's going to load instantly for your users. So you might want to investigate AMP. MP. Um, again, it's, it's kind of pushing the boundaries even more so, but it does make a huge difference to, to the whole concept of speed, um, because arguably it's loading instantly rather than causing any delay whatsoever, because it's being served by Google themselves. Notice that was very much focusing on the mobile. Okay, this is Google created these AMP pages because of delivering a faster mobile experience. And Google have gone what we now see is mobile first. Google is basically looking at your mobile version of your website to rank you. So the point here is if you don't have a well optimized mobile website using what we often call responsive design and poor old unicorn paddle let me just uh, use them as my quick example here you know there's there's unicorn paddle on the on the left there on a kind of typical mobile phone interface and you can see that it's all kind of squished and minimized and all, the whole page is kind of reduced in size so that it fits the problem with that is the, the font size is tiny it's, it's very illegible i can't click on the, the, the navigation is a difficult site to use um, compare that to rugged paddle okay rugged paddle um, well they're based in Glencoe very similar business immediately it looks like it is going to work better for me on a mobile phone lovely big image optimized to the size of the mobile phone screen I can do what I call thumb scrolling on this one where I can easily scroll down it and click big buttons with my big clunky thumb the navigation is the nice little pull down menu at the top those three lines what we call the burger icon and suddenly because they are using a mobile responsive um, web design maybe it's a template maybe they've designed it themselves maybe they had a developer maybe it's a WordPress um, you know theme they are going to get a higher score on Google, not because of all the things we've previously talked about, but simply because they work better on a mobile. So my point here is, are you checking your website on mobile? Are you checking Google's mobile test? So again, let me just quickly paste in this link for you into the chat box, just in case any of you want to play with it. It's dead simple. It basically gives you a yes, no. Let me just type this into here. Again, it tells you whether your website is mobile friendly, whether it's going to rank highly under the mobile criteria, or whether it's not mobile friendly, therefore work to do before Google really like you because Google has gone mobile first. You can check via the mobile friendly test. You can also, again, here's me mentioning it another time, Search Console, Google Search Console, you probably guessed by now, if you don't have a Google Search Console uh, account, you are missing out. There's loads of clever analytical type information and data in Search Console. One of them is Google analyzing your website to warn you against any pages which are problematic on mobile devices. And if you have any pages which have mobile errors or warnings, you want to address these because all you're doing is technically telling Google that you haven't bothered your, bothered your backside enough to do any of this technical stuff therefore it's going to creep down the rankings you want to make sure it's mobile fast works well seamless experience for all of your customers so do some checking and if you do go and check on search call as i say the good news is uh, it will give you a hint so it'll tell you you know it won't just say it doesn't work it, you know search console especially will give you some errors and give you you know a bit of detail on them well what does that you know your text is too small to read the the the, the navigation is too too close together your clickable elements can't be clicked by people's thumbs um the content is wider than the screen that usually means you've got some horizontal scrolling let alone vertical scrolling which is a big no-no on a mobile so all of that information and guidance 
is in there for you, depending on the system you're using. Uh, and again, a wee reminder to all of you, there are detailed links throughout all of these slides. If you want more on this, if you want more detail, if you want to kind of obsess over some of this stuff uh, and, and, and you know, get all geeky on it like I, like I, I take pleasure in doing, then please feel free to do more reading, do more research, follow up via these links and, and just make your site better. Okay. Hopefully Gary, all we can Gary, quick, um, Gary, I'm going to come in with a wee quick question that somebody's please asked. Um, should the AMP page, so the accelerated mobile pages yep. page, look as uh, appealing as nice as the original website? Uh, no, no, it shouldn't, and that's the whole point of an AMP page. Uh, and again, this is why some people take the view of not using them. Me, I'm more the kind of, as you've discovered, I'm more the kind of geeky, analytical, I want the, you know, the optimal. Uh, some people choose not to use them because, oh, they don't look as good. And, and, and they don't look as good. It strips out the interface, it strips out the nice design, it strips out some of your font choices, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and what it only returns is, 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 is not, not quite, but I'll say it like this, is pure content. Somebody Googled to get some good content. Here is the content being given to them, given to them as fast as we possibly can. Um, so it will look up like a much more basic page. Um, as I say, I, what, again, I'll, I'll gladly share some of the way we, we create AMP pages of our blog posts, not of the other pages of our websites. So if somebody goes to visit our homepage from a Google mobile, they get the fully featured all singing, all dancing designed homepage. Because from there, I want them to understand us, our brand, visit the rest of the pages, learn about. If somebody is Googling something which ultimately is resulting in a click directly to a blog page, they want to read the blog. So I create AMP pages of all of our blogs um, because I just want to get them at quickly, easily. I've now satisfied the need for them to consume that content. And, and, and the blog pages, as a result, are going to be featured higher on Google than not doing it like that. So I hope that's answered the question. They're, it's, they're not for everyone. And it is about you obsessing over speed uh, and how you choose to use them is, is up to you. Um, but it, w it will scale back the design a whole lot. Um, so if that annoys you, maybe don't even entertain them. But if it's about saving content quickly, there's nothing comes closer in terms of the, the, the increase in speed. Um, OK, so thank you for that, Andrew. If there's any other questions, please just ask away. Um, I'm going to quickly move on. We're going to look at a few other technical issues and then we're going to move on to other topics. Um, I'm just aware of the time. Uh, what else is Google looking to see? Google is looking to see security and web accessibility. What do I mean by security? Uh, you all kind of know what I mean by this. They're looking to see the wee padlock, the HTTPS. I'll make an assumption that nearly all of you are running secure websites these days. Okay, normally hosting providers now make it default. Not all of them though, okay? So if, if, if you are, and again, I hate doing this, but I'll quickly, I'll quickly use an example just to show you. Uh, poor old Brave View guest house in Lerwick. Here is, here is the, the, the Lerwick guest house. Again, we could debate all day long the kind of quality of the website. We'll leave that for another day. The point is, hopefully you can see this up at the top in the web browser, braveviewguesthouse.co.uk, and the browser is warning me this site is not secure. The browser is warning, and if I click on that not secure link, it says it flashes it up, up almost in red. Hey, be careful entering data here. This is not secure. It warns me about passwords. And oh my goodness, it's freaking me out. Okay, and some people are, are a little bit wary, and some people would literally take that, you know, word per word and go, oh my goodness, the Brave View Guest House is insecure. I'm not booking with them. Closed down, gone. All because of Google, the Chrome browser, all of the browsers do it, warning you that a site is not secure. Listen, it's important for your users to get trust and reassurance. It's also important for Google. Google uses security as a ranking factor. So if you're not running an HTTPS website, if you're not running, if the wee padlock is not appearing in the browser when I visit your website, you are appearing lower in the rankings than you need to be, irrespective of anything else because security is part of the ranking. And so having a secure web address increases you in the ranking. And let's just very quickly make a comment on all aspects of your website should be secure. One of the worst things you can do to absolutely plummet in Google rankings, all of this good work that you've been doing, hey, good, I'm now on page one and I'm doing really well and it's past me, like, oh, boom, I bombed, why did I bomb? Because Google detected your website got hacked. 
Google detected the actual content on your website was compromised. So while that's a whole topic in its own right, you know, when it comes to security, Google prioritizes security. So make sure that your own website, your own content management system, your own password is strong and you're applying all these updates and patches and because security is vital in Google's eyes, not just in customer eyes. Now, other things which you should definitely be aware of, I'm not going to go into any of the detail today because it's, again, a whole other topic, web accessibility. Again, good websites should be built for all users. Many of you will be familiar with things like the Disability Discrimination Act, which basically says, you know, if a wheelchair user has a challenge getting up the big steps of your guest house, then that's a bit of a problem. You should try and make efforts to put in a ramp or make it easier for them, etc. Well, the reality is web accessibility applies to the digital world as well. And so you can check your website so that people with uh, visual impairments or hearing impairments or motor skills issues, you can check your website for some of the basics to make sure that it's going to be usable by people with accessibility or disability issues. Um, and again, there's a link to some of the kind of trusted checkers, etc., and links to more on accessibility on these slides if you want a little bit more than that. One of the basic things you can do with regard to accessibility, you might remember this slide if you were here last week, I showed you this about where to start applying some of your, your keyword research. Well, I want to quickly zone in on the alt tags. Remember, we talked about this last last week, um, alternative text descriptions for images. If you don't have alt tags on your images, that's a big no-no from an accessibility point of view. And it's also a big no-no, as we talked about last week, I'm going to quickly expand on that now from Google's point of view. So um, why should you have one? Well, from an accessibility point of view, if you just have an image that I can't see because I'm blind, I don't know that that's a picture of a kid's skiing lesson on the Cairngorms. I don't know that because I'm blind. I can't see the image and you have no text alternative. So Google doesn't like that from an accessibility point of view. Google also doesn't like that from an SEO optimization keyword authority point of view. So if you really want to push the boundaries with regard to optimizing your images, so that your whole website gets better, uh, a boost for certain keywords and phrases, all the things we talked about last week, and maybe actually the image itself. Uh, again, we haven't really mentioned this last week, or I mean, probably won't mention it much today, but you'll know that Google is a, a, what I call a variety of vertical search engines. It's made up of different search engines, and one of the, the kind of search engines within Google is the image search. You can do an image search on Google, and if you use good out tags on your images. Your images might start appearing on Google image search. So here's just a few things you can start to do to really push the boundary. Worst case scenario is this is what it looks like in the code. I've uploaded an image from my mobile phone onto my website. On my mobile phone, it was called df00121.jpg, and I've uploaded it like that and given it zero out tag. Tells Google nothing better SEO optimization. Well, it's still called the same file because it's still that same file name. And I've used the alt tag Cairn Gorms. At least I've called it Cairn Gorms. At least it's now got a little bit more of a keyword density, a little bit more of a mention of a, of a word which somebody might search for. The image I'm now telling Google is, is, is about Cairn Gorms. You want to get better at this, you go the extra mile. You rename the actual file name before you link to that file name. So instead of DF00121, it's now called cairngorms.jpg. And my alternative text becomes a little bit more detailed. Describe the image. Don't just sum. So family skiing cairngorms. That is now a nicely optimized image. Uh, and that will do you no harm whatsoever in terms of Google ranking, etc. If you want to almost go the professional SEO route, again, you make it even better. The image is called cairngorms-ski-lessons.jpg. There is keywords in the actual file name now, reinforcing to Google, this is an image about cairngorms ski lessons, reinforced by the alternative text, family ski lessons at Cairn Gorms. There's a kind of long tail search, which might actually be used by somebody looking to find exactly that service. So one image on one web page is now helping optimize that web page because you've given a better alt tag, great for accessibility. You've given a good alt tag for SEO keyword authority, and you've actually renamed the image itself. That's pushing the boundaries. That's doing some real kind of professional level SEO optimization. If you get to that level, consider me impressed. You can start taking these webinars in the future. 
because it's really pushing things. Um, so that was alt tags. Again, just before I move away from this particular screen, again, I introduced all of this last time. I just want to focus in on two other things. Descriptive links. You'll remember last time I talked about how links need to be descriptive. Uh, if you're linking to another page on your own website, or indeed another page on anybody else's website, a link to a, a third party, you want the link to be keyword, not just click here, you want some descriptive content in there. Well, one thing I wanted to talk about when it comes to um, technical optimization, you want to make sure there are no broken links, okay? If I link to, um, let's just say that, you know, four years ago, I linked to a Visit Scotland blog post, as I probably have done, things like that on a regular basis. But it was four years ago. So my website now has a link to Visit Scotland. And maybe last year, for whatever reason, they changed their website, they redesigned it, they got rid of some of their old content. I'm now linking to a 404 page not found. You want to make sure that you analyze your own website, make sure that you are you have no broken links, either to internal pages, page links to your own content, or links to third party content. Google hates broken links. Google works by following links. Google's whole organization of the entire internet is based on, oh good, links we can follow to find new stuff. And here's you providing a whole load of broken links, wasting Google's time, sending people down rabbit holes. So uh, again, do some analysis on your own website. It's technical. There are easy checkers to do so. There's a link on this slide uh, called the AHREFs, a broken link checker. You should definitely go and make sure that you're checking for no broken links on your website and fixing them, fixing them, removing them, or changing them to the actual link if the link has changed or moved or whatever. And the last thing just to make a mention of is that whole thing we talked about last week about keywords in the body of your content. So when you write the paragraphs of words on every web page, whether it's blogs or the About Us page or a product description or whatever it is, again, a little reminder because arguably it's technical related, no keyword stuffing, no just repeating the word for no obvious reason. Other things to stay clear of, what we call black hat SEO, no invisible text. I'd like to think none of you would even consider this, but believe me, it used to be done to kind of fool the search engine many years ago. Invisible text, what do I mean by that? I mean white text on a white background. I want Google to read all of these words which have nothing to do with my website, because I, I to my content, because I want my site to appear higher for searches around anything and everything. So I'll use lots of invisible text saying all of these words. A uh, commonly used way of doing it was, you know, every town and city in Scotland mentioned on a web page, hoping that you then start being returned for holiday in any town in Scotland. Again, that's not Google best practice. That's considered very bad practice. So non-relevant text, invisible text, just stuffing in keywords, etc. Big no-no. Try not to do any of the kind of black hat SEO techniques. Most of you probably wouldn't even have dreamt about them. But again, just be aware. Okay, we're going to move on and talk about off-page SEO. Um, Gary, well, Gary, we're still doing that. There's somebody's coming with it. I think you might sort of be covering around this area just, just now in terms of inbound links, but somebody's asked a question just related to what you were discussing there about uh, broken links and websites. Uh, a bus one business is just about to change their website structure, uh, content and design. Yeah. How can you make sure that anyone linking to this site doesn't yeah. return broken links? Okay, so if you, if somebody is linking to a particular page on your website and you know because you're just about to do a whole redesign, a redevelopment, you know, that that page is not going to be there anymore, if you do nothing, all the all the kind of source website gets is a 404, page not found. Instead, what you should be doing, and again, my apologies, this is actually isn't mentioned in today's, in today's slides, but you should, because the question has been asked, and you should definitely, that person, go and research this, you should look to implement what's called Google 301 redirects, okay? Um, again, I'm just going to try and uh, give you a wee quick link to go and look at myself here. 301 redirects, um, and let me just send you the, the, the Google advice itself. So let me just paste this into the chat box. This is basically you telling Google, and my blog post used to be on this web address, it's now moved to another web address. So anybody who's still linking to the original address, don't just, just give them a 404 error, 
automatically take them to the new to the new destination. Therefore, the link is still valid. They might technically be linking to the old non-existent file uh, the URL, but your your what's what's called these 301 redirects on your end. You can set this up. You can you can kind of on your website tell Google. All of these old pages now exist on these new pages. One of the simplest ways of doing this, it's not the best way of doing this, is let's just say that you scrap your entire website and start afresh. Therefore, we haven't just moved pages, we've deleted all of the pages. So anybody linking to arguably any of our previous pages are going to get an error. Well, you can do a 301 redirect, at the very least taking them all to your home page. So they thought they were going to somewhere specific, but that no longer exists. So it now redirects to your home page, and that still keeps the link live and active and 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 there. It's not an error. It's not a 404. So look into these 301 Google redirects. Um, definitely important if you are changing your website, if you're doing a big rebrand, redesign, restructure. Um, arguably important for us all to know if we are deleting, moving, changing content. So hopefully that's uh, that's explained that a little bit in detail for 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 you. Let's quickly move on and talk about off-page SEO. I'm aware of the time, so we've maybe got about another uh, 20 minutes or so, and then we've still got time for Q and A. Um, off-page SEO basically refers to anything that other people can do to help you in the Google ranking. So. Last week's activity was what we called the on-page SEO activity. You can do all of this. You can make the changes. You can change your content. You can change your titles. Off-page is about other people doing things to benefit you. So some strategies would be link building. We've just talked about there's somebody linking from their website to me, an inbound link. It could be guest blogging. Me blogging on somebody else's website is off-page activity. It's somebody else's website that I'm contributing a blog or an article to, hoping that I get a link back to my own. It could be basic social media. It could be doing, you know, trying to work with influencers. This is all off your website, trying to bring people to your website. Uh, it could be forum submissions, directory submissions. The gist of all off-page SEO is about getting a click, a click back to your website, back to your website from somewhere else, somewhere independent, somewhere somewhere else on the internet. Uh, and, and Google basically go, oh, good, lots of people linking to you. We, we use that as a measure of trust. We use that as a measure of, we should probably rank you a little bit higher. Your competitors don't have that many links. Your competitors don't have good links from other people. Again, it's almost, not quite, but it's almost a case of, if you know how many links you've got to your website, what we call inbound links, and if you know that that's higher than your competitors, then again, you stand a better chance of being higher in the rankings than your competitors. All links are important. I'll kind of you know contradict that in just a second. So some questions to ask when it comes to how do you get links from others is, is ask the question, well, who would link to you? Why would somebody link to you? We'll talk about that in a minute. You know, is it suppliers? Is it customers? Is it competitors? Probably not the latter. Um, you know, who would link to you? And then the second point, well, why would they link to you? Which page? What, what content have you actually got that's valuable for them to link to? Because would they just link to you because they love you? Well, they would if they were, you know, if they did love you, but most people don't love me. So they're linking for a reason. Um, and if we can get, I'll come back to those two bullet points in just one second. If we can get a link from a third party website, could I actually encourage them to, remember I talked about descriptive keywords in the link. And, and, and back then I was talking about your links. But what about if somebody links to my website? Okay, as most of you know, my, you know my company specialises in digital skills and social media training and all of these. If somebody just links to NS Design and that's the link, click here for NS Design, then all they've really done is reinforce to Google. Okay, I've got a link, that's good. But in terms of passing the keyword authority, they've just told Google that we're called NS Design. Google knows what we're called. Whereas if they say, hey, click here for some social media experts, I'm just making this, and the social media experts is the actual clickable keyword in the link, then they've just passed some keyword authority, us, uh, authority to us. So if you are going to get links from third parties, I urge you to go the extra mile and, and almost dictate what you want to be the link, what you want to be the clickable keywords that they click and then visit your website. Um, quality and relevance over quantity, I'll come back to that in just one second. And lastly, never buy links. It's not about 
going and having no links today and 500 links tomorrow. If that's the case, Google detect, oh, yesterday you had no links today, you've got 500. You bought them. That's not organic. That's not, you know, sustainable. That that That's clearly been purchased overnight for lots and lots of reasons, which I won't bore you with today. There's a couple of links on this slide. You should definitely go and click them and read them. Um, never buy, links should be organic and natural. Somebody should have wanted to link to you not because you've purchased a link. So let's very quickly talk about link building tip number one, quality, not quantity. High quality, relevant links, okay, influence Google more. So I could quite easily, I say that, it might actually be quite difficult, but play along. I could quite easily go and get 10 plumbers to link to my website. Let's just say I run a little, um, uh, you know, B&B uh, &B in Out Bay. I know I keep mentioning Out Bay. Um, and, uh, I have 10 plumbers linked to me. Well, again, general advice, all links help. Those 10 links help. Google says, oh, 10 links. But they're 10 links of, of from, from businesses in no way relevant to me, to my business, to what I do. So instead, I'd maybe go and sacrifice those 10 plumber links from one great link from a, 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 an out bay tourist page who's talking about good places to stay. It's relevant to my topic. We're both in the same area. Here's an article about good places to stay and they are linking to me. So it becomes a relevant link. In, in my actual world, so again, as I've said, we do a lot of social media training, et cetera. Do I want a link from a plumber? Well, I'll take, a, I'll take any link. But what I'd much rather have is a link from something like Mashable.com, you know, a, 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 a popular um, Google trusted established news website about social media. Here's a site about social media using a link to our, us, therefore passing some of that social media keyword authority over to us. So when you go and think about links, go and get quality relevant links, think about established and trusted websites, organizations like universities or the media or other industry leaders, Visit Scotland, et cetera. Having said that, understand the difference between follow and no follow. This is a bit geeky, so I won't spend too long explaining this. Some links, and it's usually the links that you will find on social media, on blog comments, on things even like Wikipedia, they, they, you can create a link on Facebook back to your website immediately. So, so you could go into your Facebook and say, hey, here's a link to my website. Gary told me to create links. I've just made one. In fact, I do this 10 times. There's another 10. The problem is Google knows that it's easy. Google knows that there's no real value. Google knows that that can be done on a whim. And so these links are what's called no-follow links. Google actually doesn't pass on the Google ranking benefit of a no-follow link. What it will only pass on the ranking benefit if it's a follow link. And again, these are normally the types of links that people will manually type onto their own websites, onto their own news reports, onto their when linking to you. So don't not create links on social media and blog comments, et cetera, because they're still valuable. You still get traffic finding them and seeing, oh, I'm, there, I'm on Facebook, I've seen a link, I'll click it and I'll go to your website. You still just gained a follower, gained a visitor, but it's not actually influencing Google too much because it's a no follow link rather than a follow link. Again, that's quite geeky. There's a whole detailed explanation if you want it on this slide, but it's important that we understand some of the basics here. Link building tip number two, Again, going back to that question, what would they, why would they link to you? What, why would somebody actually choose to link to you? Are they going to link to your homepage? Unless they love you, why would I do that? So it's all about creating shareable content. Most links are generated because you have something on your website, something specific that is really good, really valuable that other people have discovered and they want to share with other people through a link to that content. So we talked about this last week, start blogging. Start blogging. Ideally, not just you know promotional me 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 type content. Start blogging about great things. Start blogging about interesting content. Start blogging about opinions and views and things to do in your area and and create content that actually people might find valuable to create links to. Things like top ten articles are no brainers. The top ten things to do in the Scottish Highlands. You know, articles like that people can't help. Well, if I'm in any way related to the Scottish Highlands and I can't be bothered creating content myself, I just look for great content to link to. So top 10 type articles always go down a treat. Case studies, expert opinions, how-to guides, the example on the right of the screen here. Here's a stand-up paddle. You know, there's that SUP again, the bane of my life. Just call it paddle boarding. SUP beginner's guide. And this is a an actual um, paddle boarding company has written a really good 
a beginner's guide to paddleboarding that weirdly loads of other paddleboarding competitors link to. Why? Because it's a really good guide. And uh, they're not quite my competitor because they're based in Canada and I'm based in Scotland. So why not share a link to this wonderful resource? Uh, and lastly, what about even things like infographics? Here's a wee example of an infographic that Visit Scotland did as part of their uh, Scotland Loves Local campaign. Um, and infographics, beautifully designed, lovely, whether, whether it's pretty illustrations or whether it's data and graphs and things like that. Infographics tend to get shared a bundle of times. You only need to go look at how often infographics are shared on Pinterest to realise that people love them, people love sharing them, people love linking to them. So th this particular page on Visit Scotland, which holds the infographic, gets linked to loads because people just like the infographic. They also share the graphic itself directly onto the likes of Pinterest, as I've said. So um, that nicely leads me into the last part of today's session, um, which is all around local. I said that that was an infographic about local and shop local. So local SEO is critical, uh, vitally important. Um, what do I mean by local SEO? Well, here's a nice little quote from HubSpot. It's about improving the search engine visibility for local businesses, especially those with a physical premise. Um, it's about driving people to that physical premise, whether they be locals already there or whether they be from further afield looking to come and visit you locally. And an interesting statistic is the one at the very bottom of the page. Near me, Google searches in the last year and a bit have grown by 136%, massively driven by COVID. We've We've all had to remain local. We've all had to stay in our, you know, local vicinities and shop in our local high streets and not travel outside our regions, etc. So local SEO has always been important. It's now, in my opinion, more important than ever before. So some tips to do local SEO, again, just from a content perspective, start posting content to Google My Business. We'll talk about that in just one second and we'll finish up today's chat on that. Uh, Engage with local people, bit of a no-brainer there, but the amount of businesses that I see who are constantly thinking about the next visitor from far away, the next visitor, you know, from 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 abroad, uh, and forgetting that you're a, that you are in a in a location, you have locals around you, they could be your champions. So engage with some of these people on social media and create content for them on your website. Your website isn't just to attract the customer; your content is to attract people who would share your content to other people attracting same customers or other locals etc it says there ensure your address uh, and maybe even a map is prominently displayed we'll talk a wee bit about that in a minute uh, and optimized local directory listings again i will cover that um what does uh how does local work how does google prioritize local again i'm just going to introduce you to some of these concepts in the time we have remaining today uh, google ranks you locally based on relevance distance and prominence. So relevance, we talked about, relevance is everything we covered last week. Relevance is, do you have authority for that word or phrase they are looking for? So if I search for um, um, local cottage in the Highlands, uh, small, small family cottage in the Highlands, are you about those things? Does Google think that your business is about that search, those words, etc., the relevance aspect of it? But of course, this is, it knows I'm looking for location now, so distance comes into play. If I go and look for something um, near me, then maybe those nearer me get returned above you know, others in the rankings. The distance comes into play as well. We'll mention that again in just a wee second. And lastly, prominence. What do other people say about this business? How well known is it? Are people actually rating and reviewing you? So you could be really close to me, but Google doesn't really rank you very highly because you've got no reviews. Nobody else is talking about you. Nobody's linking to your website, inbound links, as we've got. And so, okay, you're maybe a wee bit relevant, very close, but we think other businesses should come above you. So relevance, distance, and prominence are the main three factors that come into the local aspect of um Google and, and local rankings. So there are two main areas which Google could return you. They could return you in the directory listings. They could return you in the map pack. Now, actually, they're not returning you in the directory listings, okay? So this example on the screen right now, this is me searching for Ghost Tour Edinburgh. And the first thing above anything else which Google might give me back is directories which can give me access to lots of ghost tours in Edinburgh. So there's things like TripAdvisor. Uh, if you scroll along, you, you will, if you do this live search, you'll see it right now, you'll see a link to Visit Scotland, a directory of other businesses. Um, so 
you want to make sure that when you search for these keywords related to your business and location, local aspect of all of this, whatever directories are coming up at the very top of Google, okay, you'd like to be able to beat them and be listed above them directly, but you're probably never going to be. So the next best thing is why not be in that directory? So if somebody clicks and visits that directory, they're now just one click away from you. So I'm in TripAdvisor, therefore I might be found by somebody visiting TripAdvisor, which is the first thing given back when somebody searches for Ghost Tour Edinburgh. They're not giving back me, they're giving back TripAdvisor. So I'll be in that directory, I'll be in Visit Scotland, I'll join and have a, an, a, 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 a profile on Yelp or Foursquare or Yale or various other directory listings, some of which uh, are linked to from this particular slide. When you are adding yourself to directories, most of this is free, by the way. I've given the, the links on this slide are, are the direct links to add your business to these free directories. The top tip I'm going to give you is be consistent with your name, address, and phone number, what we call the NAP. And that's because Google likes to join the dots. If I join Visit Scotland as a business and I call myself NS Design, and I join TripAdvisor as a business and I call myself NS Design Limited, there's a bit of a mismatch on the name. If on Yelp I'm listed at a Glasgow um, G11HE, because that's where our old office was before we just moved around the corner, and on TripAdvisor I'm listed as Glasgow G11RE now that we've moved during lockdown, well, there's a mismatch. And if there's a mismatch, Google might go, that's probably not the NS design that we know. So you want to ensure wherever you're adding a listing, you are incredibly consistent with the name, the address, the postcode, the phone number. Because if Google looks at my website and sees my name and my address and my phone number, and then goes and finds an NS design on TripAdvisor, same name, same address, same phone number, it bases it on, okay, that's the same company. We now know more about NS design. We now know more of who they are, that they're on TripAdvisor, what TripAdvisor says about them. We've just built a bigger picture about that company, and you want Google to join the dots. The more it knows about you, through what you say and through what other people say, directories are a core part of that massively helping Google return you at any time. So get on these directories, focus on the ones that are important to you and your customers. Um, it all helps Google ranking and build a bigger picture of you. And if nothing else, damn it, the, the directories are above me. What well, does it matter? Because people will click these directories, you're there, you're listed, you're still going to get traffic from them, even though they're not coming to you directly. The other part you can get listed in is what's called the Google Map Pack. Okay, so these are typically the three businesses that appear underneath a map. So, this example, Ghost Tour Edinburgh, up comes a map with three businesses on the map, and underneath that, details of those three businesses. Now, again, why is it chosen those three businesses? Again, it all comes back to relevance, distance, and prominence. If I'm in Edinburgh on my mobile phone and I'm doing a search simply for ghost tour, the reality is Google will know I'm on my mobile phone, I'm in Edinburgh because it's geolocating me, and it will return the map pack showing me possibly the three ghost tours closest to me, right where I am in Edinburgh at that point in time. If I, for example, doing the, the search term Ghost Tour Edinburgh from my browser or my mobile phone, wherever, and I'm doing it in Ayrshire because I'm actually going to Edinburgh tomorrow and I'm looking for things to do, then it won't quite so much base it on location, on distance, because right now it doesn't know where I want to. And so it will simply use some other ways to rank me based on relevance, based on prominence. But it will still give me three Edinburgh ghost tours, but not quite so, so important that distance is an issue. So what does it put up there? Again, why are, why are these three examples on the screen when I search for ghost tours Edinburgh? Um, well, the first thing I'll say is that the ratings and reviews come into play, they don't actually help rank you exactly. Google don't just go, okay, the one with the most reviews goes top. It doesn't quite do that, but it uses the ratings and reviews to influence where it puts you. That's where the whole prominence aspect, that and a whole load of other things. But be aware the first thing somebody can do once they have a, a number of, of, of businesses on the screen in front of them is that the user can organize by rating. They can immediately go, only show me the businesses with four, you know, four stars and above five stars and above. And so huge importance that we get better Google reviews. I'll talk about that in just a second. Other things which help, notice that, well, keywords in these reviews. So the first one there from the ghost bus tours, 
there's actually pulled onto the Google results a review, okay, from a customer. Didn't see any real ghosts, but horrifically good. Okay, now I search for ghost tours. There's the word ghost in a review. It's increasing their relevance. They, again, if you go and get reviews, what words are the people using? Try and get them to use the right relevant words. Don't just say, Gary's company was great. Instead, get them to say, Gary's company provided the scariest ghost tour I've ever been on in Edinburgh in my life. Uh, I'm now scared to death of seeing any ghost. What have I just done? Got more keywords onto my content through a customer review. Increases relevance. Um, most uh, results on the map give some helpful information for visitors, such as opening hours, closing hours. You want to make sure these are correct and accurate. Even some things, things like phone numbers, etc. Um, and also notice the the map listing can occasionally also go just go and pull content from your website. So here is the City of the Dead tours. And, and one of the reasons why it's on here is because Google knows because it's joined the dots that their website is highly optimized for the phrase ghost tours. So again, this all begins to join back to what we talked about last week, keyword authority, getting the right words onto your web page, getting the right words onto the, the titles, uh, joining the dots, making sure that this content typically comes from Google My Business. Now, I know we've not got a lot of time left, but I want to very quickly do a quick poll. All of that content comes from a system called Google My Business. I'm going to ask you, the poll should be running now. I want to know if you have an, an active Google My Business profile. Um, are you already on Google My Business or do you not have a Google My Business profile? And if you don't know what Google My Business is, then make the assumption that you don't have one. Um, okay, the results are coming in fast and furious. Um, over 25% of you, oh, it's just gone down a little bit. No, it's back up. I feel like I'm commenting, com commentating here on a, on a horse race. 25%, higher or lower? 25% uh, of you say, no, we do not have a Google My Business profile. There, of the remaining 75% of you, it's split 50-50. Yes, but I don't update it. And uh, yes, and I do update it. So what, what I'm trying to encourage all of you is, A, to, you absolutely must have a Google My Business profile. Even if you're not a physical premise that people come to, I still advise you to get a Google My Business profile. More than that, I urge you to use it. Okay, so the 25% of you said no, task one for you, get this thing up and running. Of the 38% who say yes, but I don't update it, task for you, start updating it. And those of you who are already active on it, let me just hopefully give you a little bit of a recap of things you are currently doing, helping your business do better. Uh, thank you for that. Okay, so. Um, you know, Google My Business profile, this is typically how we will see it. We will see a mini listing below the map uh, or indeed on Google Maps directly if Google decides that you are worthy of being listed on, on the map pack based on, uh, again, relevance, distance, prominence, etc. But nine times out of ten people are uh, coming across your Google, business, Google My Business profile because they are Googling you, what we call a branded search. So when you search for Mercat Tours, uh, especially if you search for Mercat Tours Edinburgh, uh, you will get you know what looks like the following onto the screen right now. Before going anywhere, I'm still on Google. I haven't gone anywhere. I've still just done a search. And on the right-hand side of Google, I get all of this great information about this business. So First thing is go and get a, a Google My Business account set up. It's free, it's easy, it's simple. Once you've done that, you want to optimize your profile. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, the first thing you need to do is verify it. If you can get it verified, fantastic. You don't need to get it verified to have the profile active and live and working for you, but a verified profile will do a lot more for you. How does Google verify you? Well, you've basically told Google, I'm this business, I'm based here, and here is, here is my details. And so it needs to check that. And so typically it will either phone you, email you, or nine times out of 10, send you a postcard to the actual address that you need to kind of confirm you've received. Get your uh, uh, listing verified, you've got a stronger Google My Business local profile. Next thing, I've, I mentioned this earlier on, but I'll repeat it again, ensure you are consistent with your NAP, NAP, name, address, postcode. What, what do you call yourself on your own website? What address and postcode do you use? What do you call yourself on the various directory listings that you're on? What address and postcode do you You want to make sure you are using a consistent name, address, and postcode anywhere that Google has a chance to join the dots and understand more about your business. If you don't do that, it might actually never make a connection between your Google My Business profile and even your own website. 
because it detects them as maybe different businesses, they're using different data. So consistency is key. Next thing, you want to write a description, a nice keyword rich description. The, again, this is before anybody goes to your website, they've seen you, they've Googled your name, up comes on the right hand side something about you. Hey, we are Mercat Tours, we do walking tours of Edinburgh, exploring the blah, 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 something um, you know appealing that pulls the customer in. Notice you can only see 244 characters, you have to click the more button to get the rest of the 750, but write a good description. Again, remember keywords. Let's take this right back to last week. Keywords in that description. Again, are you using the right words? Are you calling it paddleboarding or are you calling it SUP? Let's not go there again. <laughs> Off your high horse, Gary. Um, what about choosing a category? You should indeed think and choose the most appropriate primary category. Google My Business will say, hey, which category do you fall in? So again, take some time, go through all of the categories, pick the, the most important, relevant, close to you primary category as you can, and maybe choose some additional categories as well if you kind of do fall under kind of a, you know, more than one. Category listing is important because somebody searching for, even just somebody going onto Google and searching for a holiday accommodation service, because you've listed in that category, you stand a chance of being now returned onto the Google results just because they've searched for the category. Uh, holiday accommodation service in Edinburgh. Why would somebody search for that? I don't know, but you get the point. So think carefully about the category. And lastly, make sure you're filling up all your attributes. Um, the category specific, so if you claim that you are a hotel and you're in the hotel category or a restaurant in the restaurant category, there will be some attributes very relevant to you, like your menu, um, you know, your, your, uh, do you serve, is it breakfast, lunch and dinner? Um, so depending on the category, it opens up these various attributes, which you basically tell Google what you provide. There are, uh, right now, there's a whole load of uh, COVID-19 specific attributes, which you should definitely be looking at. You know, stuff around, do the staff wear masks, uh, do customers need temperature checks, et cetera, et cetera. Just to paint a better, more honest, um, trustworthy picture of your business on Google, uh, on Google My Business. So that when somebody reads it, understands it, sees all of this, they, they now can make a, a decision based on the reality. Okay. Above and beyond just having the profile, this is for the 38% of you who said, yes, I've got one, but I don't do much with it. I want you to get more active on it. What do I mean by that? I want you to post updates. Google My Business allows you to post almost like Facebook type updates. Okay, When you log into the admin side of Google My Business, you can do a post an update. And that's a bit like posting a Facebook status update or a Twitter update or a LinkedIn update. It's you just you doing that update on Google content on Google My Business. Keep in mind, I said this last week, Google and Facebook, etc., don't really like each other. So if all you're doing is spending every day updating Facebook and never updating Google My Business with some of the similar type of update news, latest events, you know, new products, things that you might want to see on your social media, I urge you to consider Google My Business as another outlet for that type of content influencing Google, not just Facebook, etc. So start posting updates. Start posting photos. Again, a lot of people on Google My Business post up a few photos at the start and then forget to do any more. Photos can be added whenever and you know however you choose. And it will usually ask you to kind of categorize them. So Google says, hey, is this an exterior picture of your building? Is this an interior? Is this your team? Is this something else? I urge you to flesh your Google My Business profile out with lots and lots of photos. You can pick which one is your logo. You can pick what, which one is the kind of cover banner that they sometimes show, show and prioritize. You can kind of highlight. You, keep in mind, other people can add photos as well. This is a community resource. I, I can post pictures of your restaurant because I, I ate there yesterday onto your Google My Business profile. At the very least, be aware as to what is appearing from other people, and if any inappropriate ones are there, you can flag them up. You can usually get them removed in some shape or form. But the but the images influence people, so make sure it's the right images. Likewise, the Q and A influences people. Uh, Google My Business has a question and answer uh, part, whereby on your Google My Business profile there are previously asked questions and your answers to them. Now, here's the thing: if nobody is asking you asking you any questions, you can kind of cheat and ask them yourself which is what, what you're doing, you're populating your profile with more of the right words, the right phrases, the right questions that I want people to see because that will influence them and influence them well. So you can actually start to do this yourself. Likewise, you can start to add up all your products and services. While before I've even left Google, I just Googled your name and I know some of your products, I know what the prices are, If I and I see pretty pictures about these things, and I, if I click them, it takes me right
right to the page on your website to buy that stuff. So again, very, very powerful. Uh, and again, those of you who are maybe, um, you know, running organizations where people can actually uh, ask you and, and get you to quote on particular bespoke tours or something like that, you can actually turn on capability like quote me button, what's called the request the quote button. If you're a, a, um, a restaurant, you can activate the reservations functionality. So real clever functionality all built into Google My Business. You do, you're a little bit restricted based on some of their third party providers, but again, just be aware of what's there. The last thing to talk about is you wanna definitely use Google My Business to respond to and indeed encourage more reviews. Remember I said the reviews are used, they're used somewhat in the ranking, they're used for people to organize the ranking and reviews influence people again there was a whole visit scotland um webinar a good few weeks ago now uh, about how you need to be using reviews to influence customers so make sure that google reviews is very much part of that process again when you log in as an admin there's a link straight on your google my business homepage as an admin which says hey go and encourage more reviews get more reviews and you can click that and it gives you a link to send out to customers Hey, thanks for coming last week. Here's a link. We'd love if you reviewed us on Google My Business. Thanks so much. It really helps. More reviews on Google My Business. Okay, final slides. Uh, it's really just a quick summary for all of you. And I realize I'm slightly over time. My apologies, but there's some good questions throughout. So I I'm going to hang back for any more. So don't worry. But we're not, I'm, I'm not rushing off. And please hang back if you've got any. Final slide, a summary of everything we've covered. Uh, last week as well as today last week very much around authority keywords keywords in your web content fresh content blogging content works an absolute cheat but keyword authority also i hope you now understand you know is is impacted by google my business google my business content what have you said on your google my business profile what have you posted up about and um, what fresh content have you talked about there Trust, how does Google, you know, kind of uh, work out whether they should trust you or not? Lots of things, an obvious one being your Google My Business reviews. Other people say you're good. Other people say you should be trusted. It also uses inbound links, off-page SEO. Hey, Gary's website must be good. He must be trusted. He's got lots of links from other people to his website, as opposed to others who have maybe less. Therefore, I look like the better trusted organization I will be higher in Google rankings. Uh, things like speed, again, some of the technical things. You want to make sure that at the very least you optimize your images. You want to tighten up your code. You might want to consider using, you know, a content delivery network. Bit, bit geeky, pushing the, pushing the boat a little bit there, but again, all of which will help you provide a faster website for Google. It wants that, especially when it's done on a mobile, because Google is now thinking mobile first. You want to check your website on a mobile checker. You want to check it loads quickly. It's easy to use. It's thumb scrollable. It's not horrible and clunky to use. And lastly, security. Google ranks based on security. You want to make sure that you're running SSL. You want to make sure that you're running a secure website, that you have got a, a good non-hackable non uh, you know, WordPress installation. You don't want to be running an old version of WordPress because Google will detect, oh, there's an old version of WordPress. That's not a secure version of WordPress. And all of these things impact your security ranking in terms of where Google put you. So those are the topics we have covered in uh, fast and furious fashion over the last uh, last week and today. I hope all of this has been um, understandable. I hope it's all been uh, you've been able to resonate with it all, and I hope uh, you are going to take away a, a few kind of top tips and kind of action plan to go and implement some of this on your own website. Any of the above, you're higher on Google than you were last week, last month. That's a good thing. That might lead to more business. Right. I'm going to hand back to Andrew. Thank you very much. I'm still here though for any questions after Andrew begins a wee quick wrap up. Gary, thank you so much. Uh, so, uh, so many uh, helpful tips, hints today that you've you've gone through, and um, I think that's highlighted by the fact that we've had questions already, uh, and we've got some a few more as I, I show a few helpful links and resources on screen just now. Be a reminder that you can catch up with any previous events uh, on our uh, Visit Scotland News YouTube channel. That's YouTube.com/user/VisitScotlandNews. All previous um, recordings are made available there, and this today's session will also go on there as well. You can also look at our visitscotland.org website and all of our previous webinar content, along with a lot of other um, excellent digital advice content, is on visitscotland.org as well. And there are further uh, events 
uh, available for you to register um, on thegateway.com, Business Gateway's website slash events. Um, there's one that I should mention at the moment. It's not up there quite yet, but it will be getting added to the Business Gateway uh, website very soon. And that's a, a panel discussion event that we're having on August the 25th at 12 noon for tourism experiences. And um, that will feature a, a bunch of businesses, uh, booking system businesses, um, as well as some Scottish tourism businesses themselves who will be discussing online bookability um, and distribution via other large well-known uh, travel agent websites like uh, TripAdvisor. That's for tourism experiences, that's visitor attractions, activity providers and uh, tour companies. Uh, so that will, uh, in the next few days, be going on to Business Gateway. Uh, bgateway.com slash events and you'll be able to register uh, there for that event. Uh, so Gary, coming through to a few questions and whilst whilst that's, uh, whilst I'm just bringing up these questions, I'll also display our uh, feedback link for today uh, on the screen just now. Uh, pins for this business gateway feedback.com, the pin for today is 12012 and the handout for the slides for today is on the screen as well though I know that my colleagues just put that else just put that in the chat as well which is great so Gary just a few questions before we finish up um, you mentioned WordPress on a, a number of occasions today using it yourself uh, one business has asked is it worth paying for the Yoast uh, plugin uh, the premium version of that how would you view that Okay, I can only really answer that from my own perspective, and, yeah. and that is simply to say that I use the free version of Yoast. Maybe that's just because I'm a cheapskate, I don't know. Um, but the free version of Yoast, uh, for me, does all I need it to do in terms of some fairly advanced SEO capability of updating my titles, my metadata, my generating my 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 site maps as per today's chat, um, and it will do all of that for free. You just need to add in add that in as a as a free plugin. Yes, there is indeed a premium version of it available, which gives you more functionality. But uh, for me, that, that's that's clearly not required, or or I'm not willing to pay the price because, uh, as I say, I, I stick with the free version, and and for what that gives me is 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 more than enough to really help enhance the SEO side of the website, uh, a lot more so than not having it at all. Um, you know. You know, WordPress, of course, a lot of what we've covered is covered in the core of WordPress, but you know the, the the real benefit comes from looking for these clever clever plugins. Yoast being one of them, which really kind of tweaks and makes better the SEO optimization side of all of this. So for me, it's the free the free version of Yoast. And um, if if whoever asked the question uh, tries a tries a, a premium trial and they love it, tell them to get in touch with me and, and sell it to me, and I'll, I'll gladly look at it. But for now, uh, I just make do with the free version. It's it's absolutely good enough great stuff on that on the wordpress note again gary do you use um do you yourself use wordpress to reduce image sizes somebody was asking a question about image sizing is it better to to reduce the size of the image prior to uploading or is it okay to just do it within wordpress itself okay again uh, everybody has different views on this it depends on what you're comfortable with what you're good at your, your own photoshop capabilities etc etc uh, me i'm all for cutting corners where the corners are cut well and efficiently and and the end result is a good one and i i, I do just cut a few corners here again i use a, a wordpress plugin um, which, which, and don't ask me to name it because off the top of my head I can't remember. Um, but again, there's loads of them out there. Do a bit of research. Which basically, as I'm uploading the image to WordPress, it's already doing that compression reduction, asking me to make sure. You know, it's warning me, Gary, this is a huge file. I, I use, you know, and and it's kind of doing some of that kind of um, optimization on the fly. So, so again, mm. if you can do it like that, fantastic. Again, I don't want to just talk about WordPress because not everybody uses WordPress. You know, not every content management system has built in tools or plugins to do that so if for whatever reason the system you're using doesn't do it itself then you'll need to kind of almost prepare your images in advance before you give those images to the system um, and that's where you know an understanding of some of these freely available tools or getting better at Canva or or, or um, Photoshop or any of these kind of image manipulation tools really really important the point is as long as you're doing it how you do it I don't mind um, so as long as you're doing it Grand, grand. Kraken dot. I think it's 
Kraken is a very good one as well. You look up Google Kraken. That's another very good uh, one for optimizing Brilliant. images. Thank you. Um, query from a business about uh, Google Street View. How often does Google change the Street View? <laughs> if it's no longer accurate to a particular business, can they ask for their Street View to be removed or changed? Um, it's incredibly difficult to do so. Um, my my advice on that, and this is not me trying to kind of, kind of look for an easy answer here, but I, I, it, it genuinely can. The short answer is, Google uh, update the street view very irregularly um, and again it's not consistent so you know maybe centre of Glasgow they are driving their car with a camera on the top of it through every year um, you know maybe in the back streets of Ayrshire you know they've been once and they don't have any plans to come back who knows and so it's very very inconsistent and irregular so so that you're, you're kind of at the mercy of, of them doing it. Um, Two things you can do, and again, I won't get into the detail of this, but but be aware, and and by all means, again, any of any of these also more than welcome to contact me after today. I might I'm easily found. Just 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 Google keep keep the theme Google NS Design, and you'll find me. Um, you you can you can. Google will occasionally uh, run some webinars and physical, they haven't obviously been doing many through COVID, etc. but they'll occasionally run some physical sessions themselves where Google people are in the room. And, and, and if you get the chance to kind of chew the ear of an actual Google rep who has access to some of their systems, I, I've heard of people, you know, having having a good kind of you know, chin wag with, with the Google people themselves directly and slowly but surely tweaks being changed the problem is you know that's not always possible so if you can kind of bend the ear of, of google try and do it trying to do this directly through the web through the internet through their their, their support systems they, they don't really entertain you very much i'm afraid i have to say the other thing you could look at is you can actually upload your own kind of google 360 type content you can actually start to populate your google my business profile with your own um integrated content which will start to integrate with google maps so you again if you go and and for example go go and visit google street view in city center of glasgow as an easy example walk down buchanan street you'll start to see little links on the actual map which jump into the business, into the into the reception, into the restaurant, into the meeting room, because you can create some actual map integrated 360 type panoramic content yourself and have that not replace what Google Maps is showing, but enhance it and augment it. And, and so it becomes a little bit more fresh and relevant and, and up to date than what Google might be doing themselves. So uh, again, I would, I would urge you to kind of do a wee bit of investigation there as well. On, on a very similar theme to that, Gary, is it possible for a business to create mul multiple profiles for multiple locations? So if I've got a tour that's running in three different locations in Scotland, can I yeah. put them in different areas? Yeah. The, the short answer is yes. The long answer is be careful because the, the, the legitimate way of doing it, the way Google want you to do it, is actually have more of a physical premise in the so if I am a if I'm a shop and, and I'm in Inverness, Aberdeen and Dundee, then I can legitimately create three um, Google My Business profiles based on the bricks and mortar shop in those physical locations. That so so yes to multiple locations. No, albeit I'm not going to lie to you, I know plenty of businesses who don't abide by the rules 100% and I'll let you make that decision whether you want to or not. No, if you're not really there, you just operate out of those locations, if that makes sense. What Google would then rather you had is one Google My Business profile and and then the actual, there's, there's a section in there whereby you tell Google the kind of reach that you've got, the regions you serve, the the, the parts of Scotland or, or the UK or beyond that you actually provide your services to. It would rather you had one location and simply telling it that you operate in other regions. Um, but as I say, I, I've known other service-based businesses to kind of flout the rules a little bit and suddenly have what looks to be three physical locations in three physical places not actually the case but 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 they get they're getting away with it um and and hopefully from from their perspective they continue to do so so again uh, hopefully that's a wee bit of a of a steer on on what you can do and and what you what you are you should be doing from the rules perspective as well superb gary thanks that i think wraps us up for today and we'll run out of time Thanks to everyone who has joined us this morning and I wish all of you to have a lovely afternoon. Take care, everyone.